We live in a world that respects no authority. Nothing is sacred and everything is questioned. Even those of us who profess to follow Christ waver when our preferences are challenged. In an age without absolutes, we need a clear picture of who Jesus actually is. The book of Colossians does that. We discover his identity, his power, and his authority. Colossae was located on a trade route from east to west. People passed through with stories and philosophies and ideas all the time. While it became a melting pot of religions and faiths, it remained a small and relatively insignificant town. The book of Colossians is a letter from Paul, sent to a relatively unknown group of people living in a humble community on a major highway where people pass through but rarely stay. Sound familiar? Sound familiar? Hey, we are thrilled to have you in church. Uh, if you don't have a set of notes, we're gonna move through a chunk of Colossians chapter one. So you raise a hand, we'll bring them to you right now. We don't need to um, belabor the fact. Um, I'm just gonna mention it and keep moving because there's a lot to do. And I know I say it every time, but it's true every time. I am so encouraged and humbled and proud that our sons and our daughters are on stage. Ladies can worship. Those were all students on stage today. Um, are freshmen and juniors, and I just, I, and it's not just that like, oh, okay, we let them every once in a while. Like, we get to have them every once in a while because they're so doggone good. Steve Lucero is over here. He's the one who leads all of the worship um, ministries for um, students, high school, junior high, fifth, sixth venue, two through four venue. I've known Steve since he was a high schooler himself. He is just one of the best humans you'll ever meet. I love him to death, and I love the work he does with our students. So that is that. Okay, I'm gonna tell you a story. It is probably true. It's like 90% probably true. I can't verify it. There's no Wikipedia page, okay? It doesn't got its own like Instagram feed that proves the story is true. Um, and so you're gonna be questioning, is that really true? And then you're gonna question, what does that have to do with the price of chicken in China? Like, I don't understand why you even told that. It will be obvious as we move through our morning why I told the story. But I'm gonna tell you right off the bat. So I went to a small Christian college down in San Diego. Like a 1,000 people went to this college, okay? And uh, there, you don't have a ton to be proud of when you go to a tiny little Christian college, but there was a guy on our basketball team who could shoot the lights out, okay? So in, in the world of like West Coast Athletic Conference, um, Christian colleges, we had the premier shooter, okay? His name was Chad, well, our rival with all these West Coast Christian colleges, right across the desert from us over in Santa Clarita, there's Master's College. They actually had a guy who could shoot too. And they thought their guy was better than our guy. And we're like, no, our guy's better than your guy. And like, this is like kind of nerdy Christian college rivalry stuff. Cause like, what are we gonna do about it? Well, our student cheering section decided we were gonna set up in the bleachers right where he liked, their, the other guy liked to spot up for his shot. And we had all sorts of very mild-mannered Christian college chants um, that you'd be embarrassed if you're like, oh, look at you sweethearts trying to get in someone's head. But anyway, so we set up and we're like taunting him and cheering and stuff. Then like when possession would change direction, we would all move and get in his head again. And when those games happened, our guy would shoot better than he, because of us. Like we were champions, right? Like we got in his head and we were so proud of ourselves. So then we all graduate college a couple of years go by, and I'd completely forgotten about Mike Pemberthy. Well, a couple of years go by, and my buddy, Chad, who was our shooter, um, we're having lunch together, and he's like, dude, did you hear about Mike Pemberthy? I'm like, no, I don't even hardly remember. He's like, dude, the Lakers picked him up. They needed a shooter. Like, someone's hurt, and they picked him up. He'll probably be off the team when their other guy gets better again, but he's probably gonna play for like two and a half, three months for the Lakers. And I'm like, oh, joke's on me. Like, I lose this round, right? So the way the story goes, so um, he said, yeah, and did you hear what happened? And I'm like, no, I didn't hear what happened. What happened? Well, he's been showing up to practices in his Astro van because, like, he's a college, Christian college graduate. Like, we didn't even make a lot of money, guys. And so he pulls into one practice, and Shaquille O'Neal looks at him and says, what was that? I can't do a Shaq impersonation. I'm sorry. Like, that's, <laughs> I can't. And, uh, and Shaq, Mr. Shaquille O'Neal says, what's that? And he goes, it's my car. And Shaq just shakes his head and goes into practice. The way the story goes, 
The next day or a couple days later, Mike Pemberthy pulls into practice in his Astro van and Shaq is there leaning on the hood of a black Lincoln Navigator and throws him the keys and then walks off and he says, Lakers don't drive Astro vans. (laughs) And walks in, okay? In my heart, I believe is dead true, okay? That sounds like the most Shaq thing of all time. And the guy who told me is not a liar And so I believe, I can't prove it, but trust me, that quote from Mr. Shaquille O'Neal is the passage today. I'm going to read you this. I know, you're like, Tim, there is no way. You finally failed, Tim. There ain't no way. Oh, there is a way. (laughs) Open your Bibles to Colossians chapter 1. I want you to see these scriptures all morning long. Because Paul is writing to this small, insignificant town on a trade route to somewhere else. You don't stop there unless it's for gas for your like moving caravan and then you keep going. And it's easy to think that your life doesn't matter. And we live in a community where it's easy to think like, man, I love my church and I love my kids, but like I'm not all that important. And then we read these words from scripture. Give me the verses. For this reason, since the day we heard about you in Victorville, We have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives so that you live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power, according to his glorious might, so that you can have endurance and patience, giving joyful thanks to the Father, who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people, in the kingdom of light. He's rescued you from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Ooh, roll the tape back to 9 and 10. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped asking God to fill you with wisdom through his Spirit, so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord. That right there is the call Paul puts on Colossae. Colossae was nothing. Like you would move through it and not even notice. Like you're waiting for the next gas stop and you're like, oh, I don't even remember that. It's like Danuba or someplace like that, Galt or some small little town as you're going somewhere else. And Paul says to them, he's leaning on the hood of the gospel and he tosses them the keys And he says, you don't understand. You think you're not all that important in all of this. Do you understand the generation that God has put you in? Our generation is toxic. And they consume each other. Everything is an argument. Everyone's wrong. Everyone's evil. Everyone's the enemy. And you stand as a chance to rep the colors of the kingdom. And when you put on the purple and gold, it means something. So don't be rolling up to practice in no Astro van, okay? Will Chamberlain wore these colors. Magic Johnson wore these colors. I, Mr. Shaquille O'Neal, wore these colors. Lakers don't drive Astro vans. Christians don't make things worse. You are called to live a life worthy of the Lord. And then he gives some infinitives. Um, these, these four like cascading verbs that are a call to action to us, like, okay, all right. So I am a Christian in one of the most pivotal generations in American culture. Everything is so radically different about our life. Even, I mean, I'm not old and I'm not young. I'm right in the middle. And I have seen our culture change. And you stand in it. And the keys to the kingdom have been tossed to us. And God's saying, you've got this. This is the generation that you live in. And so we're going to work our way through the four ings of this passage. And these are the four things that Paul is saying, okay, I'm asking God to make you smart enough to know what it means to live a life worthy. And if you're confused, I'll clarify. So write these four things down. The first one that he's calling attention to is this. A life worthy of Jesus will see you bearing fruit. It says it right there after it says, okay, so look at verse 10. You may live a life worthy of the Lord. And please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work. Tim, I don't even know what it means to live a life worthy of God. 
Like, I love my church. I love God. I follow some Christian-y things on Instagram. Um, but I don't, I don't know what you mean. Like, live a life worthy of the Lord. That's a big call. Yeah, it is. And so Paul's going to use four verbs to frame how it could even happen. And the first verb he says is this, bearing, bearing fruit. Well, that, I mean, if we can be like real plain for a moment, bearing fruit is a really bible phrase, right? Like it sounds like, oh yeah, that's good, bearing fruit, okay, praise God, praise God. Um, Tim, what's it mean that my life is going to be bearing fruit? Like if you showed up to job in your classroom, like they're going to tell you the benchmarks for your grade level, right? If you drive truck, they're going to say, hey, here's your load and here's where it's got to get and here's when it needs to be there. Like cool, but if you rolled into work and your boss looks at you and you're like, man, I'm just really excited for you to bear fruit today. You'd be like, What? <laughs> Like, you know, man, like, we got this job. We're going to build an overpass for the freeway, so let's bear a lot of fruit. You know, like, I, what? I don't, I don't know how to bear fruit. Like, what are we doing today? Well, the Bible says one of the things that you should be doing, the call on your life as a believer, is you should be bearing fruit for the glory of God. You're like, man, that sounds so christian church good. I'm down. Tim, what's that mean? I don't exactly know. Well, let's use different stories in Scripture to explain it, okay? Um, because it's a word picture. It's not a set of instructions. If you bought a Lego set of the Millennium Falcon, and then you looked at the instructions, first of all, it would take over your life, but it would tell you, grab this piece and do this with it. Well, bearing fruit is a word picture. So let's look at some stories to understand, okay? All the way in the beginning, in the book of Genesis... One of the early chapters, one of the early stories is the story of the Tower of Babel. Do you remember that? Really interesting, um, if you listen to, you know, like ancient Mesopotamian history podcasts, uh, uh, we all know what I'm talking about, right? Um, you guys know that people, as soon as you could build a little bit of a kingdom, a little bit of a civilization, dudes like to build. Like, that's just the way it is. Men in history like to build things. And so these old, old old buildings were called ziggurats, and they're impressive. If you look up, um, you might not even know how to spell the word, but if you look up a Google image search of ziggurat, gosh, they are impressive, and they're mind-bogglingly, they're just crazy ancient. Like if you lived in Greece, like 400 BC, like 350 BC, Alexander the Great, when he traveled the world, he would see these ziggurats, and he would think, holy cow, those are old. And now 2,500 years later, they're like ridiculous. So the Tower of Babel is one of these ziggurats that's being built. And the way the Bible tells the story is this, is that the civilization, the citadel, the city, whatever word you want to use to describe these people, they're building it and they say to themselves, let's build a tower that's so high that it reaches the heavens because we're going to make a name for ourselves in this world. And God looks down and he says, no, 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 don't do that. Because if you're so obsessed with your work that you become intoxicated with yourself, it is a step away from me. And then another step away from me. And another step away from me. And literally, as you grow the floors of this building, you become convinced you have no need of God. So don't do that. Let's live life together in relationship. Everything in your life I've given you. I've made the provisions for you to have this. And the intelligence and the weather systems, and the peace that has to endure so that you have the time and the space to even do this. Don't. And so he confuses their language. That's the old school Bible story of the Tower of Babel. But really what that story is, is is a story of us bearing fruit to ourselves. It's the work, it's the labor, it's the result of your life being self-obsessed. And God doesn't want that to happen. And so if you're bearing fruit in your life that is all about you, God will confuse it. Well, there's another story at the very end, very end of scripture, also doesn't use the language bearing fruit, it's just another word picture, it actually says bearing light. Uh, the book of Revelation, in, large, in the beginning at least, is written to seven churches. Most of those seven churches are scattered across modern day Turkey, in case you're curious. And it's really interesting, as people would travel along these major highways, they would move through these cities. And it was like there was a design to it so that God could have the entire world influenced 
as they moved through, they would get to these cities and there was a source of light. There was a church. And in the confusing time, in the obsession with power, money, and wealth of the Roman Empire, not of the American Empire, you would move along these highways and you get to Smyrna or Laodicea and you'd have this, this witness, this church. And the way Jesus describes it, it's a different word picture in the book of Revelation. It says it's a lampstand. And the, the whole collection of churches were like seven lamps in this like candelabra. And if you move through your life with seven different sources of light, it's bright. You know what to do. And Jesus is speaking to the individual lamps, the individual cities, the individual churches. And he's speaking to them and he says, don't let your light go dim because as people are moving through this world and they see there's more Jesus, there's more Jesus, they get to your city and your light is dim, oh, I'll snuff out your light. I don't want people to be confused about me. People should, people should know when they see me. It should be clear when they see me. It's like Jesus is tossing the keys to the kingdom to Smyrna or Laodicea, these, these different churches in the book of Revelation, and he's calling them out, and he says, you gotta bear fruit. He doesn't say fruit in Revelation. He says light, but it's another story that explains what this concept is. Best story by a mile is a crazy one. It's in the Gospels. Jesus is walking to the temple, and on the way, he's hungry, and he sees a fruit tree, and he says to the disciples, hey, I'm hungry. Let's go swing by that fruit tree, grab some fruit, and then we'll go to the temple. And they get to the fruit tree, and there's no fruit on it, and Jesus is grumpy, and he curses the tree. He does not curse out the tree. That's a different phrase, okay? But he curses the tree, and the disciples are a little bit weirded out. They're like, why is... Why is Jesus, oh, we're still going, okay. Why does Jesus curse the tree? Like, well, I don't understand. Well, then they get into the temple, and that's that story of Jesus flipping over tables and whipping and saying, you guys have turned church into a swap meet. You've turned an opportunity to meet God into a chance for you to capitalize on people's fear and their guilt, and you're making money. They should be coming in here and being fed by God, and instead, it's dead in here. And so then they leave, and they're walking back out, and the disciples are like on full alert now. They're like, man, he is cursing trees and starting fights. It's, we need to rumble. Like, get ready. And they pass by the tree again. And when they pass by the tree, they're like, oh. And the tree is just all withered and gnarled and like dead. And they pass by, and the couple guys that wrote that in their gospels is like, oh, I get it. This fruit tree looks like the sort of thing that I would go over to when I need something. And when I get there, it's a taunt. It's a nothing. Oh, and then we went into the temple. That thing that looks like it should be something, and it's a nothing. It's a taunt. And so when we pass by that tree again, like, oh, the tree is dead because the temple is dead. Guys, when God says, okay, I pray that God would just teach you what it means to live a life that's worthy of him. The first thing Paul says, your life should be bearing fruit. You shouldn't taunt this generation that like, oh, I'm a Christian, I know Jesus. Really? Because man, I'm looking and there is nothing in your life that reminds me of love, grace, wisdom, strength, peace. Like nothing in your life looks like that. Some of you guys have grown up in a family of faith and you know what this means. And in your classroom, in your truck, on the job site, in your office, you know what it means to bear fruit for God. And we praise God for you guys. The, every, every single week you guys fill out the prayer requests and then you turn them in. A lot, a lot, a lot. 13, almost 14 years. I've been praying for people that you pray over your work environment. Man, we pray on them every single day. And I know that it's hard. But some of you guys, you haven't grown up in a family of faith. This is all still new to you. And you're like, I, Tim, I don't know. Like you're, I, I, say it plainly. What does it mean to bear fruit? It means that the work of your life honors God. Somehow, some way. It's not just a sermon. This is me blabbing for 35 minutes. But work that honors God can happen in the classroom or in a truck or on a job site or in the medical field or whatever it is. And maybe if you don't know how to do that, I, I'm gonna be very direct. You need to join one of our volunteer teams at the church because our productions team, they ne they're never on a stage. They're always back behind the scenes making things happen every Thing that they do is for the glory of God. Our campus safety team, they are never known, they are never seen, but everything they do is for the glory of God. I mean, Raquel on our stage this weekend, 
She's not a professional preacher, but she's up here like, hey, I want my life to make an impact on others. And so if you join one of these teams, listen, this is not about us like, hey, we need someone to pay attention to the junior high kids because they're driving us crazy. So can, no, 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 no. This is about you saying, God, do something with my life that teaches me how to bear fruit. But I need to keep moving. Write this question down and then the next point. What fruit is God obviously growing through my efforts? I don't know. That's on you. That's not on me. But bearing fruit, <laughs> toss you the keys. Here you go. You've got this. Second point, growing in knowledge. All right. You may live a life worthy of the Lord, please him in every way. Bearing fruit in every good work. And number two, growing in the knowledge of God. Right? Growing in knowledge. I'm going to tell you, I've told you for years, um, some of you guys who are a little older than me, y'all ain't old, but you guys know that for years, as I've been growing my kids, you guys know I've been terrified for one moment. How in the world do you shift from like having your kid playing video games and not remembering deodorant to driving a moving vehicle? Like that pivot, like how do we go from that? Like you can't just like accidentally like respawn somewhere like your Fortnite stuff is gone and like, oh, well, I'll find another gun. No, 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 no. Like you gotta get driving right, right away. So my son and I, he's almost 16. We've been practicing in parking lots. And praise God, we live in a desert and open fields, man. <laughs> like, the coyotes and the rabbits are faster than my son. So we're okay. So we've been practicing. And then he did the um, classroom work. And then three weeks ago, the, um, the driving instructor showed up to my house. And I looked that man in his soul. And I said, how's this going to go? And he said, it'll be fine. And I said, I don't know, I don't, I just, I, I don't, like, I just don't know. <laughs> like, sometimes he forgets deodorant, like. <laughs> and he says, well, what have you guys been doing? And I said, we practice in parking lots, and we practice in open fields. He's like, oh, you'll be fine. I'm like, bro, I need better than fine. Like, I need, and he says, well, we're going to go out, we're going to spend two hours. I've got a gas pedal and a brake pedal on my side of the car. I'm like, do you guys do well, too? Like, <laughs> Because sometimes that's an issue. <laughs> and he said, we'll be fine. And then my firstborn child just walked away. And man, I started praying. And not no like middle class white America Baptist prayer, like Pentecostal, okay? Like <laughs> South American Pentecostal prayer. Like, querida padre. Why did that name? Señor. Like... <laughs> I've been in South American Pentecostal churches. Like, <laughs> this one's going on the internet too. Um, <laughs> and he was gone. And, uh, and then like two hours go by. So like three minutes go by and I check my watch. I'm like, Phew, okay. Four and a half minutes go by. I check. I'm like, okay. All right. No, it's cool. I'm fine. I'm fine. And then he gets back, and the car wasn't damaged. No humans died. It was, like, totally successful. And so then he, he, he hands over the, the paperwork, and he says, okay, you can take him out on roads now. And I was like, ah. <laughs> <laughs> So the last few weeks, we've been driving on roads. I'll tell you, Saturday mornings in Apple Valley. Just stay home, okay? Just. <laughs> it's shocking. Shocking. How many things run through my mind when we're driving? And I don't want to, I, like, we've been teaching him. I've been teaching him for months. And he's a great kid. He's a smart kid. And he knows. Man, we're driving through town and, like, just our neighborhood. And, like, he's slowing at stop times. He's checking. He's checking. He's checking. He's checking. He's checking. He's checking. Just, just, just go. <laughs> no. And so we're doing our laps. And on the third lap, He'd gotten, like, we're getting good at this. Third lap, there's this lady in her robe shuffling out to her mailbox to get her mail. And I'm like, oh, she didn't know that was going to take her life. <laughs> so I just asked him, like, I'm just, I'm like, so what's different about the road this time um, than before? And he's thinking, like, did the traffic law change? Like, is there new signage? Like, he's, like, so textbook right now. And he's like, I don't know. I'm like, there's a human now. <laughs> like, don't hit her. <laughs> and he's like, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, I saw her too. I saw her too. I'm like, oh, good. That's... It is shocking how many things go through my mind. Does he know this? Does he know this? Does he know this? Does he know this? Because it's all important. 
It's all important. You live in a culture that is obsessed with constantly sharing their deeply emotional opinions about everything. We cannot have a tragedy without it instantly turning to an argument. It is toxic, toxic, toxic. And now you, Christian, have been tossed the keys by God and he's saying Christians don't make things worse. Christians make things better. We don't act a fool out in this culture. We don't drive an astro van when we're a Laker. We bear the name of God and we live a life worthy of the Lord. You've got to be growing in your knowledge to handle this generation. You just do. Because the liberal and the conservative media cycle are passionate about the next talking point, the next talking point, and the next talking point. Here's the beauty of this, guys. We get to step out of the mess and we get to be humble and we get to honor Jesus. But you're going to be intimidated to ever speak up in this generation if you don't know what you know. And so you gotta know. And so you've got to be growing in knowledge because as you move through these streets, there are so many things that we're noticing, so many things. And it's insane to me that I cannot stand on a stage and say God loves the black community and God loves the white community and God loves the Latino community and God loves the Asian community because someone's going to get mad and someone's going to get offended. No, I know what the scriptures say. And Christ has torn down the dividing wall of hostility. And so I'm going to say those things. I'm going to say in my marriage that's difficult and hard right now, I know how to be a godly husband. I'm going to move into my workplace that is probably not godly. And I'm going to know how to operate. I'm going to be on the soccer field. I'm going to be in the classroom. And I'm going to know what to do because I'm growing in knowledge. And it's a high call on your life. Sorry, y'all. Y'all wearing the purple and gold. And Lakers don't drive Astro vans. And you can't slack off in your growth of knowledge. God is above this culture. And he is not prone to the chaos. He is better than this. And you can be too. But it's hard. Because we don't got time to go to Bible college, right? You can go in your small group. Oh, small group. I don't want to sit in a living room with weirdos eating jello till Jesus comes back. <laughs> small group. It's like the epicenter of like awkward Christian culture, man. Like I'll go to a Christian bookstore once a week instead. I'll buy Christian mints instead. Okay. I like, <laughs> man, my small group, some of the best doggone people in the desert. I love them to death. They, yes. Ah, some of us, some of us that sit in living rooms with jello, we know. <laughs> no, because you know, you know why I love it? Because they open up the Bible and we read scripture. And we don't, like everyone, I know it's unfair. I went to like Bible college twice over. I know it's not fair. I love them because they're reading the scripture. And then we meet on Tuesday nights because we are tired after that, man. <laughs> and we move into our Wednesday and our Thursday and we're trying to live the scriptures. Write this question down. Where have I grown in my knowledge of God? And has it affected what I do? We talk about this every single week. Sometimes it's like quick because we're laughing and talking with each other. Sometimes we talk about it for an hour, but we talk about it all the time. You can grow in your knowledge. And here's the thing. You've got to grow in your knowledge. Third point, write this down, being strengthened. Hmm. I just told you that the Bible says your life has got to be bearing fruit and you've got to be growing in knowledge. You just do. And you're like, that's why I love HDC because the services are good and the programs are good and I, I can watch Christianity happen. No, you cannot. That's a spectator. That's, that's not a participant. And so after Paul says these things, look at this beautiful, gorgeous verse 11. Being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might so that you may have great endurance and patience. Yeah, okay, we don't do the Greek a lot. I don't do the Greek a lot because I, I, I don't know how to like bring a culture that loves memes, which is not reading, all the way into like this nerdy scholarly stuff that says, okay, in the English it says this, the original Greek words say this, but this one's too good to pass up. The Greek words is en dunamis, dunamazazo, yo. Like, like it's, it's, it's the same word twice over. Dunamis is the word for power or strength. Okay, dynamite, dynamic, dunamis. And the, the, in the Greek, it says, in dunamis, get dunamist. Like, in power, get powered. In strength, get strengthened. 
Paul knows that he's just given a high call and he says, here's the thing, Christian, put yourself in a position where you're strengthened by God. Put yourself there. Pursue him in prayer. Humble yourself in worship. Pursue him in, in church attendance so that like, God, I'm looking for you, not in a way that says, I wonder if I like church. I wonder where God is in my life. It's so different. And then as he's begging you to believe that God is strong, that God is powerful, and he desires to share power with you. His intention, his plan, his design is to share strength into your life. You're gonna say, okay, God, if I'm gonna bear fruit or if I'm gonna grow in knowledge, I need you in some way. Awesome. All of a sudden now this dynamic relationship is spiritual and we're able to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength because he's giving me the strength to do it. And then he calls me out to love my neighbor as myself. So we began our year with this hashtag goal, like this goal, when we're in the book of Colossians, it's about this. It's about him. It's about the up. And we know from this verse right here, that God is begging you, be strengthened by me. And you're like, okay, cool, God, fix it. <laughs> fix my knucklehead spouse. Fix my kids. I'm gonna send them off to camp. Six days, they'll come back fixed. <laughs> God, fix my workplace. God, fix my finances. Like just, just pow. Because I, so I read the verse and it says, in power be powered, in strength be strengthened, in dunamis dunamazazo, like just, ja. no, oh, we got to read the whole verse. It's so unfortunate. Oh, man. <laughs> Being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might so that you may have endurance and patience. Oh, well, that's worse. I, I want his power to solve my problem, not give me resolve to solve my problem. This is such a big difference. But the glory of God in this generation will shine through when you, in your difficult marriage, humble yourself and say, God, what can I do in my spot in it? Because I'm gonna need some strength. God, in my workplace, I'm gonna need some strength. God, I, I, I signed up to volunteer with the junior hires because Tim said, if I don't know how to bear fruit, to volunteer. And then I did. And then God, you gave me 12 lives to make a difference in. Oh, I'm gonna need some strength. God, I've been moving through this financial peace class because I want you to be honored with my finances, man. I just, I don't wanna build a tower to myself and always be in confusion. God, you be honored through my finances. Oh, I'm gonna need some strength. Okay, that's the way it's working. That's that spiritual dynamic relationship that this generation, this church, we're convinced God has our back. And as we step into these things, we do it with a pretty high sense of confidence because he's giving you strength. So if, you, if you're humble and you're faithful and you're moving through this, you need to be reminded God is giving strength. Be bold and ask him. In prayer in the mornings or in the evenings, whenever it is you're praying on things. In worship, when you're in this room, be praying on it. Like ask God into these things. Don't just pull yourself up by your bootstraps in the American dream and do it on your own. No way. Let's do this together. And some of you guys, I'm so sorry. I'm gonna try and be humble, but some of you guys are so doggone stubbornly independent. You need to hear that your strength is gonna come when you humble yourself and you're asking God, and you're asking God to give you resolve not to solve it because if you're a doer, if you're an achiever, if you're good at things, then you're probably gonna be like, cool, God, let's bang this out. I got a goal. they like, you're gonna bang this out in the next six weeks because at work, that's what I do. In the gym, that's what I do. With my finances, that's what I do. And so God, and God's gonna be like, no, I'm gonna work in you to move you through it. Ugh. Humble yourself. Write this question down and we're gonna get our fourth point. When have I felt God's strength in the middle of frustration? It's the beauty of difficulty. It's the beauty of the high call to bear fruit or grow in knowledge because you're going to need to ask God into your frustration. Get frustrated that you don't know the Bible. That would be the best frustration you could have this year. 
Because then you're like, God, I don't even know the doggone Bible. I don't know the story of the Tower of Babel or the seven lampstands of Revelation or the, the fruit tree in the temple. Tim explained it, God, and I don't even get it. He went too fast, and I don't even get it. Teach me, God. He will. He will. Write down the fourth thing. Giving thanks. So that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way. Bearing fruit in every good work. Growing in the knowledge of God. Being in dunamis, dunamazazo, in strength, being strengthened. Verse 12. And giving joyful thanks to the Father. So Friday, my little nine-year-old girl turned 10. And we had a birthday party. And I don't want to make you jelly, but it was pretty fun. We had 13 little girls over. And then there were four moms that came to help. And me, I felt soups masculine. And we did a spa day party. And we bought little mask kits from Target. And all the little girls sat in a recliner. And then we did masks. And then um, we painted their toenails. And then um, my daughter was just like freaking out. She's having so much fun, okay? It was like it was like little 10-year-old girl like Tweakerville. Like, oh my gosh, I'm so excited. <laughs> And these girls are running through my house and all the moms knew how to do facials and how to paint and I'm faking it till I make it. I'm moving through the house. I'm like, yeah, we're gonna scrub. We're gonna, what? And so uh, we're moving. <laughs> then comes the moment where every, every elementary age birthday party where a child feels like they got elected president of America again, it's when they sit in the chair and then you put the presents around them and they open them one by one. And my little girl was buzzing by the time she got to that point already. And then she's surrounded by gifts. And she's like, I'm the queen of the world. And so she starts to open presents. And I'm back in the back looking at her, right? And I'm thinking like most parents. I hope this is like most parents. I don't know. Maybe I'm just messed up. I'm thinking, look at the card first. Look at the card. Just read the card. Look at the card. Acknowledge the card. And then she, and then she looks at the present and she's amped and then she sets it down and I'm like, say thank you, say thank you, say thank you, oh, say thank you. <laughs> and I can tell, I can tell, she's 10 and she's just like swirling, amped right now. So I had a little like mini nine-year-old, 10-year-old Christian rave and she's just excited. And so I can tell that she's gonna forget to thank people, I can just tell. I can, you can see it on her face. And so I'm walking through the room and I just kind of like squat a little bit by the chair of power. I'm like, girl, you burn a friend from you. <laughs> and, then I, and then I keep going. And she, her head whips up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Like, <laughs> Do you know how good it is for your heart for you to stop and say thank you. We are prone, I am prone, to be discontent with what I already have because it feels like it's almost enough. Almost there, God. Almost have enough to give my kids, you know, the brand of shoes they want or the phone model that they want. Or like, guys, I am sweating it. I think most of my kids wanna go to college. And I'm like, I don't know, good luck, like, I don't know. <laughs> And so I tend to be worried about what I don't have. And there's nobody walking behind my chair telling me, look him in the face and tell him thank you. Why is it I expect more out of my 10-year-old than I expect out of myself? Praise God for the scriptures. That I'm reading this, I'm like, whoo, man, live a life worthy of the calling I have on my life. God, what do I do about that? Tim, bear fruit for me. All right, I'm gonna do that. Tim, grow in knowledge. All right, I'm gonna do that. Tim gets strengthened, and then Tim give me thanks. Okay, all right, that's what I'm gonna do. So you can write this last question down. How do I express my joy and gratitude? Like, where is that in your life? I'll say this, I'm wearing our baptism shirt because next week is our class to get ready for Easter. And some of you guys haven't taken the step of baptism because you're intimidated. It's nerve wracking. I'm scared to death right now because the lights are on and there's people and like, oh, I don't know about this. God, I, I, would love, God, I would love for my life to symbolize that I'm caught up with you in your burial and in your resurrection. That baptism, like it's such a gorgeous picture. God, I'm so grateful. And God, I want to do, I want to do that, but ah. Oh, 
I don't know, God, if I get up and get baptized, I'm gonna pass out and barf. I, I, don't, I can't. I'm so nervous to do that. Oh, God, but now Tim's talking about baptism. And he's saying it's a way to express joy and gratitude. God, the Bible says I need to go. Oh, and next week at 11 is the class. Ah! How can you express your joy and gratitude? Because you got to look him in the face and say, God, thank you. I, in my humble opinion, I think you need to set aside a day a week and tell him thank you. I just do. But let's do this. Show me the whole passage. The way I live my life, I tend to say, okay, God, what do I got to do? I'm going to do it. Put it on me. Like I add another to-do list to the wonder list. I can do this. Okay, I got to live a life worthy. Okay, I got to please him in every way. I got to do good work. I got to get some knowledge. I got to be strengthened. I got to have endurance. I got to have patience. I got to give thanks. Okay, and I tend to miss all the rest that's in the passage. And this is what God is doing in and around my work. These are all the things God is doing as I'm pursuing him, not a task list. God is going to fill me with his knowledge. God is going to give me wisdom and understanding through his spirit. He's going to strengthen me with all power according to his might. He's going to qualify me to share in an inheritance. He's going to rescue me. He's going to move me from a dominion of darkness. And he's going to set me in the kingdom of his son. I'm going to wear the purple and gold. I'm going to walk in under the banners. I'm going to drive a navigator. I'm going to walk out to that culture. And I'm going to say, God, you will be honored in my life. My life will be worthy of your name. Amen? Amen. God, I pray for us. Call us to that. And God, not in a way that makes me more obsessed with my work and my effort and my knowledge. God, put something on me that is a big call so that I need you. God, I've got to know what you think about these things. And God, I need your strength so that I act on these things. God, I want to live a life that honors you. Not that looks Christian-y from a distance. But as I move through this life... Your name is made famous. So Jesus, call it us to it and equip us for it. In your name we pray. And everyone said, amen. amen. You guys are dismissed. Have a great day.